Hi, I'm Pastor D, and I pastor Truth Free Will Baptist Church here in Titusville at 5311 Varna Avenue. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to tell you about a special service that we're having. Uh, on the 17th of September at 10 a.m., we're having what we're calling Someday Sunday Celebration. It's based off the concept of you invite someone to church and they tell you, well, not this Sunday, but someday. And then you run into them a little bit later and you say, hey, how about this Sunday? And they say, well, not this Sunday, but someday. Uh, so uh, Sunday, the 17th of September uh, at 10 a.m., is the uh, Someday Sunday Celebration right here at Truth Free Will Baptist at 5311 Barn Avenue. And it's the opportunity for you to tell your friend, hey, you promised me that someday you would go to church with me. Well, guess what? On the 17th of September, uh, Truth Free Will Baptist Church down here at 5311 Barn Avenue is having a someday Sunday celebration. And so that would be a good opportunity for you to go to church with me. Uh, they're going to have the Sounds of Praise Ensemble from Southeastern Bible College. Uh, there's going to be a fellowship dinner uh, afterwards. And so it just sounds like a really good time of fellowship and uh, worship. So we want to invite you to come and join us. Uh, we'd love to meet you. Uh, certainly if you don't have a, a, a church home, uh, we would love to have you come and, and check us out. Uh, regardless, we would love the opportunity to worship with you. Uh, we thank you for your, your consideration. Have a good day. The three laws of stewardship tonight that uh, you'll just bless the, uh, the teaching that we've had. And uh, Lord, that there's been some things learned and maybe some changes made in our lives and maybe different outlooks and so i just ask that you would uh, just continue to bless us with your word use it to embolden us and empower us to do your will we ask it in your precious name amen all right so tonight is the last night of the 33 laws of stewardship and uh make sure i'm good to go here so we uh, come up with the definition of uh, stewardship is the faithful management of all that God has trusted us with, time, talents, gifts, wealth, possessions. It's understanding that we are never the owner of any of these things, but have been entrusted by God to manage these things in a manner that brings glory to God. So uh, it's one of those things that, it's one of the buzz phrases that people say, you know, it all belongs to God anyway, uh, but do we actually live that way? Do we actually, uh, does our uh, thought process carry us through uh, the realization that yes, it does all belong to God, uh, and and based on that, uh, it, do we manage it in a, in a way that brings honor and glory to Him uh, with what He has blessed us with, uh, and are we doing that consciously uh, to honor Him? So uh, tonight, the last one of the law is the law of loving compliance. Uh, pure obedience prompted by pure love produces pure stewardship. So when Jesus came into this world, he did so as a helpless human infant. Uh, there was nothing about his outward appearance that drew any attention to him. He wasn't a physically handsome man, uh, one that would attract attention in a physical manner. Jesus' attraction would be a spiritual attraction. Isaiah 53, 2 tells us that, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when uh, we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And so uh, what that tells us is, is that uh, our love for the Lord, uh, uh, especially when he was uh, walking on this earth, that there was nothing uh, physically attracting, um, that there would be any kind of a confusion uh, with someone as to what their motivation was uh, in loving him. And so we see that happen, you know, uh, all the time with uh, people, young people, uh, you know, they, they fall in love with someone because of their physical beauty and they fail to pay attention to their inner beauty and then you know down the road they find out that uh got a pig in a poke so to speak and so uh listen if a person isn't beautiful on the inside i don't have care how pretty they are on the outside it's going to be a rough road to hoe there so uh we want to understand what love should be based on in Philippians 2, 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So uh, Jesus is God the Son, came to earth as a man, 100% human, 100% God. Uh, as God, he humbled himself to his Father and submitted himself to his Father's will, that being, uh, that being to be sacrificed for the sins of all mankind. He had to come to this world. He had to live a, a life as a human. He had to do so perfectly so that he would be uh, a worthy sacrifice for the sins of all mankind. And of course, he was able to do that and to be the sacrifice for, for you and me uh, so that we could have uh, eternity in heaven. 
we um, understand that when he left heaven and he came to this world, that uh, he humbled himself uh, for us and endured the things, endured the cross, endured the shame, the guilt, the humility, uh, so you and I could have a way to be reconciled with the Father. Jesus was by his very nature God, all that God is. Jesus Christ was, is, and forever will be. Uh, what can be said of the Father can be said of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet there is only one God. Uh, Jesus was not simply the most God-conscious man who ever lived, nor was he simply like God. He was God, uh, equal to God in every way. Now, he, um, how do I say this? He, um, tempered, that's the word I'm looking for. He, uh, maybe he yielded some of his uh, uh, abilities, some of his powers uh, as a human being. Uh, while he was on this earth uh, to endure the things that he endured so that he could experience, you know, Jesus experienced hunger, thirst, pain, uh, separation. Uh, he, he knew what it was to, for his family to, uh, to disown him and, and to not believe in him and things of this nature. So scripture teaches us that, you know, our Savior understands everything that we go through. You know, I've been with people in moments of, of loss and hardship and tragedy, and, and one of the things that will come out of, of people's mouths uh, so often is nobody knows. Nobody knows the pain I'm in. Nobody knows the anguish that I'm experiencing. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. And I will gently remind them that, yes, there is one who does know, and that's Jesus Christ. He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows the pain that you're experiencing right this second. And uh, not only does he know, but he cares. And so we, uh, we need to understand that we are never, never, never alone. I got a call from Brother Tom Moody last night. I was out uh, working up at uh, Karen's mom's, and, and uh, I answered the phone. Brother Tom said, you know, Pastor, we need your prayer. And uh, so what's going on? And he was telling me that they have a young neighbor that had just committed suicide, uh, a uh, guy that was in the service, suffered with PTSD, a wife, and I think he said two young kids. And uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a horrible thing to, uh, to hear those things. And, and I've never met this man in, in ever, but I still, I just feel so bad for the family and for the loss and for the hurt. Um, and, and it's still that, that idea that when a person takes their life, you know, they're doing it because... I, they've got to say that think that they're all alone. That there's no, there's no way it's going to get better. There's no fix to it, and 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 of course they're wrong. You know they they're wrong about that. And uh, you know what's he saying? It's a temporary solution or a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And so uh, so it's just horrible. And so one of the things that we need to help people understand is that listen, you're never alone. I don't listen. Even if you're an unbeliever, you're not alone. God's still there. As long as you're drawing breath, God's there. God's trying to intervene in your life. God's trying to draw you to him. And so, uh, so there's always, always hope uh, if you're drawing breath. You know, it's not, it's not a done deal. As God on earth, Jesus had set aside his deity. He didn't portray himself as one who was to be worshipped. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. He did that as an act of humility and obedience to his father. In Philippians chapter 2, 6 and 7, says, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Sometimes uh, I think about, um, we've all run into them. We've run into people that, you know, they, they really think that they're special. They're, they're God's gift to the church and uh, they think very highly of themselves and uh, and it's always it's always hard to uh, to meet those folks because you understand that uh, they've got it backwards, they've got it wrong. Um, you know that for those of you that have been here a while and you've seen when I put up a, a church leadership uh, chart, it's an inverted triangle, and because uh, you don't work your way in ministry, you do not work your way to the top. All right, in ministry, you work your way to the bottom because every level so to speak of responsibility that you assume in ministry 
what you are saying is, is that I will be a servant to this group of people. And then, you know, a uh, Sunday school teacher is going to be a servant to the students, the ones that come to their class. And so they will serve them by studying for their lesson, by preparing and then presenting it in a manner that can be understood. Uh, the trustees, they serve the church and um, in the way that they care for the, the facilities and uh, look after the property of the church. And then, you know, the deacons serve the church and, uh, as far as uh, uh, providing leadership and guidance and, and some uh, spiritual uh, direction. And then, of course, the pastor serves all of them. Uh, the pastor serves the deacon, the trustees, the teachers, the, uh, the, the singers, the musicians, everything like that. And so uh, you don't work your way to, to a pinnacle. You put yourself in a position of humility uh, to serve all of those people and to do so with a, with a humble heart uh, and a heart, you know, of, of service. Um, there's nothing... Uh, there's nothing greater, in my opinion, uh, than to be able to serve another person, to, to do uh, for them in a time of need. Uh, there's nothing greater than leading someone to Christ. Uh, there's certainly, uh, uh, other than that, the only thing that's better than helping someone through a crisis, whether it be an illness or uh, a personal loss or something like that, uh, is leading someone to the Lord. But to be there to them, to give them uh, encouragement through the Word of God uh, is certainly uh, an important role that we all should be prepared for. And we prepare for that by studying His Word and then by being available. Listen, you can be the, you can be the most gifted theologian in the world, but if you're not available, what good are you? You know, you can, listen, I've met a lot of people that they're just, when it, they knew the Word, they just didn't live it. You know, they hadn't, they, they, I don't know, I don't understand it. I don't understand how people can know what the scripture teaches and then ignore it and live uh, in sin the way that so many do. So Jesus' loving compliance to his Father's will brought about the single greatest act of humility possible in this world. Jesus surrendered temporarily the splendor of heaven and his heavenly attributes to assume the form of a servant. And then, um, and he, like I said here in uh, 6 and 7, he made himself of no reputation. He wasn't... Uh, he wasn't here to be honored. He wasn't here uh, to uh, promote himself. He was here to promote God the Father. Uh, Jesus' humility was uh, self-motivated, self-induced. He was not humbled by others. He humbled himself by submitting to those acts by man designed to humiliate a person. Um, his submission to the abuses of man were done as a willful submission to his Father's will. Jesus' commitment to please his Father was evident in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Understand this, that uh, when Jesus came on this earth, he was never, never, ever uh, at uh, the disposal to man as far as the schedule was going. Uh, he was in charge of whenever he would submit himself, that he would uh, commit himself to the cross. Uh, Pilate wasn't going to uh, rush him. The disciples weren't going to rush him. The people weren't going to rush him. Uh, it was going to be on his terms. When the time uh, was right in the Father's plan, then Jesus would lay down his life as a sacrifice. So he was never uh, out of control. He was never, you know, they didn't, I personally, I don't, I personally don't think that they wrestled him down to the cross. Uh, I think he offered himself. Uh, you know, I just don't think that, why would, why would he fight that? I mean, that was his whole purpose to be here, was to offer himself. And so I can't, for those that would have witnessed that event, it makes no sense to me that he would have struggled in any way, shape, or form because that takes away the willful um, offering that took place. And so that's just my two cents. In Matthew 26, 39, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Jesus was preparing to submit to the injustice of an unlawful arrest an unjust and illegal trial, not to mention the mockery and the physical abuse he endured at the hands of his accusers. Jesus endured all of these things willingly for you and me so we could be reconciled with God the Father in heaven for all eternity. Uh, as, as you well know, as you go through and you read the Gospels, you read the account of Jesus' trial and illegal, uh, every aspect, uh, falsely accused, mocked, slapped, spat upon, uh, the crown of thorns, 
um, the, the abuse that he went through, the carrying of the cross, uh, and of course the, um, the cross itself uh, for Christ to, to do that for you and me. That's why as we, as we go through that, if, we, if we, we read through those things, we need to make it personal because it is personal. We've been talking this year about being intentional with God. Understand that when I say that, uh, I'm saying it based on the fact that God has been intentional with you and me from the day of our conception, that he, had a, he has a plan. He's had a plan since eternity past. Uh, God has the ability to know all things instantly. And so how he does it, <laughs> okay, uh, I just know he does. I just knew that, that he knew that I would need a Savior and that when he was on that cross dying for me, that that was his purpose. I'm going to offer myself for D. Miller. I'm going to have to offer myself for Debbie, for Karen, for Janet, for Warren, for Flora, for Peggy, for John, and for John. And so, uh, oh, don't want to forget Dave and Mike. Uh, <laughs> don't want to leave them in the fringes <laughs> over there. So, but it was personal. God's, God's whole uh, plan for us is, is intentional. There's nothing accidental about God's relationship with us. Um, when we have a tragedy strike in our life, God doesn't go, oh my, how did that happen? No, he, he, he knew. He knew this was coming. And what we sometimes, you know, 2020 hindsight, uh, sometimes uh, you understand looking back at things that had happened prior to the tragedy that had prepared you for that. You didn't know why you were going through it at the time, but, you know, then it becomes manifested in whatever it is you're asked to endure, the valley that you've been asked to walk through. Uh, I've seen it in my life more than once and look back and go, wow, you know, God was really being good uh, as far as uh, looking after me. And so uh, I'm sure that you all have probably experienced the same thing. In Romans chapter 5 says, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, Christ died for us as sinners and sinners who were uh, naturally opposed to God. Uh, we were, listen, if you're not with him, you're against him. And so, uh, but he went to the, listen, here's the thing. As we've been studying in the book of Nehemiah last week, uh, when we talked about, you know, the, the joy of the Lord is, is our strength, and we look at how the fact that how many times the children of Israel had, had sinned against God, and that it was God's good pleasure to restore them uh, to fellowship with him. And that is where the strength of the people lay, is the fact that God takes joy in that. God takes joy in uh, the redemption of a lost soul. And so that's, that's our strength, that we know or we should know uh, that because God loves us, because he sent his son to die for us, that all that effort, all that uh, majesty, all that miraculous uh, events are guided towards one event, and that's my salvation. And when you think about that, man, that's powerful. That's powerful. Uh, and here's the thing, that if we could help people to understand um, if God loves you that much in eternity past. And, and listen to me now. He loved everybody like this. He loved the ones that he knew or that he knows is going to reject his offer. He loves them the same way that he loves me. That's powerful. That's powerful. So what I would say and what I remind myself of at times is that if he loved me that much in the past, he loves me that much today. So whatever I'm going through today, you know, good, bad, indifferent, uh, it's according to God's plan. And God's plan is based on his love for me. And so, you know, uh, when I was sick, I was sick. God walked me through that. Some of you have been down that same road. Uh, some of you have been through other types of tragedies, you know, loss and, and uh, relationship issues and things like that. And so uh, how powerful it is. And if we, could just, if we could just help some of these people to understand how strong God's love is for them, 
then we could avoid things like suicide um, and some of the, the hurt and the helplessness of being experienced in this world. I don't know about you, but me personally, I hate to see anything or anybody scared. It's such a helpless feeling. I don't like seeing an animal scared, uh, but I certainly don't like seeing a human scared. Um, I think it's bad for anyone. Uh, I certainly think for a man to be scared and to feel helpless, you know, maybe it's because I'm a man, you know, that just seems really uh, uh, doubly bad. But God is there, and we're never alone. And if we can just learn to trust him, to love him, to have faith in him, to the extent that these outside influences don't penetrate, that we're, we're able to, you know, uh, resist the devil and he will flee from you, to keep him at, at arm's uh, length away from us, uh, to keep his influence from harming us, our brothers and sisters in Christ, our church. Um, so why did Jesus come? Well, he came to live that perfect life as an example to man and to establish his worthiness as a sacrificial lamb for mankind. He came to die for our sins. He came to conquer death in the grave as our resurrected Savior. The number one reason Jesus came, he came to do his Father's will. Because it's God the Father's will that we would be saved. Uh, it's not his will that any would perish. So God, in eternity past, and go to 1 Peter chapter 1, and uh, around verse 20, 21, somewhere in there, uh, where we understand that before the, before the world was even formed, and God had ordained his son to come to die for our sins. And so it was God's will from eternity past that we're going to have to do this, son. We're going to have to. We're going to have to give them a way to be reconciled. So what does his sacrificial death have to do with stewardship? Well, just as Jesus came to do his Father's will, we too are to submit to our Father's will and strive to be obedient in every way to his commands. Jesus' compliance has resulted in the work being done. It is finished, is what Jesus said. He has done what we couldn't do. He lived the perfect life that would allow us to stand before the Father in heaven. So... And, and here's the thing, and I've asked the question before from the pulpit, is who in the world uh, does a person think they are if they're going to live this life and do not feel uh, committed or submitted to the will of God the Father? You know, if, if his own son came into this world and his whole purpose was to be submitted to his Father's will, who in the world do we think we are to be disobedient to the Father's uh, commands? Uh, you think about that, that's pretty arrogant uh, for, for someone to say, ah, I know what the Bible says, but, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it my way. Really? <laughs> I, I always get amazed at that. I've had several conversations through the years with people. They'll tell me, I know what the Bible says, but. And I said, well, where are we going with that? I said, it ain't going to be nowhere good. The saving work is done, but our serving work continues. We aren't asked to hang on a cross to pay for our sins. Jesus did that. Uh, we aren't condemned to a spiritual death where we are permanently separated from God. Jesus did that on the cross for us. What is left is to tell others about Jesus' sacrificial death. Our part is to serve, to go and to tell others the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He couldn't have left us with a simpler task. I mean, all you got to do is talk. I mean, he's not, he doesn't ask us to uh, endure, you know, physical pain and all these other things. Now, certainly, certainly we have different circumstances. Listen, I was on a conference call yesterday with, um, I don't remember, there's eight or nine pastors uh, that are going through this HOPE initiative thing uh, with Dr. Moody. And uh, one of the things that struck me as I listened to these other guys talk is that we are all in the same boat. We are all facing the same challenges. Um, I don't think there was any pastor on there that had a, a particularly large church. Uh, I got the feeling that probably most of us are, you know, 40, 50, something like that. Uh, one mentioned they were at 75, and I think there's one that might be over 100. But, uh, but still the same uh, as we would kind of give our little two-minute briefing on where we are with the HOPE initiative and what we've done and how we instituted it and how we executed it and all that stuff, and then uh, uh, Dr. Moody would say, okay, you know, uh, Josh, I want you to pray for Brother D, and, you know, my prayer was that, 
you know, I need more participants. I need people who um, want to take part in the HOPE initiative and that having sent those daily emails out, I was trying to convey to our church that there's nothing here that's terribly burdensome. There's nothing here that's intimidating. Uh, this is something that all of us can do. And so that uh, in doing it, though, uh, I can tell you that I've had my eyes open to a few things, and there's a different way that I'm going to approach uh, some things as we go forward. Uh, uh, Sunday, I'm going to have Sister Cheryl share with you uh, some of her experiences that she's had with the Hope Initiative, uh, just as an encouragement to people. But um, the point of that is all this, is that I think sometimes uh, we kind of get lured into a, uh, a false sense of, you know, there's a church down here running 500, so they don't have any problems. You know, they've got 500 people, they've got plenty of money, they've got plenty of resources, they, they can engage in, in all these different ministries and what have you, and, um, but that's not true. Uh, you know, I remember years ago, Karen and I were driving past Temple one evening, and um, back then their parking lot was a disaster. It was, it was just horrible. And I remember saying to her, I said, see, look at the problem he's got. That's a $100,000 problem, you know. Uh, we have our problems. We have our $10,000 problem, but he's got his $100,000 problem. I think I'll keep our $10,000 problem, right? <laughs> and so um, so we have, everyone has those uh, difficulties in their ministries. Uh, we're all faced with, we're, we're, we're faced with indifference. Uh, today, you know, the culture, there's so many people that are indifferent to uh, the gospel. Uh, believers seem to be a little bit um, indifferent in how they live for the Lord and their commitment for him and so it's it's one of those things that all of us are faced with as pastors and deacons and leaders in the church trying to keep people motivated keep trying to keep them encouraged um, listen uh, we've got a week and a half until we have our Sunday Sunday celebration and yes I'm praying for it and uh, inviting people to it praying for those invitations praying for those particular people that they will show uh, praying that when they get here, we'll see someone come to Christ. And just, um, and honestly, what I, what I ask the Lord for is that we have several people in our church who have family members that aren't believers. And, and, and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, if we could see one of those come to Christ, what a shot in the arm it would be for not just that person, but for our church. I sent Sister uh, Penny a text Monday morning I was just still, you know, buzzing at the news that her grandson had got saved. And I said, man, I am just so happy for you. Uh, I know how hard you prayed. And, and uh, you know, it's just uh, very encouraging uh, to see our prayers, you know, the, the, some fruit to, to be born out of that. And so, uh, so we want to see that. I, uh, I want to see people saved. I want to see people encouraged. I want to see people spiritually matured. Um, and I want to see that for the strength of our church so that through the strength of our church, we can reach more. Uh, listen, I had a guy one time, and, and uh, he wasn't, uh, I could have taken it as criticism. I, I didn't. I, I understood what he was saying. Uh, he said to me, it's so, such a shame to see that beautiful facility of yours not being used every day. And uh, I said, yeah, I understand. You know, really, I'd love to have, uh, I, I wouldn't mind having an AA meeting here and uh, you know, recovery ministry and uh, women's ministry and all these other things that are out there that other churches with more resources are able to do. Uh, yeah, those things are great, and I would love to have that going on here. But that's not where God has us right now. Uh, God has us here um, with, with our church family. And one of the things that I think is special about truth is the family atmosphere. Uh, I do think we love one another. I do think we care for each other. I, I do know that, and when I and I tell people, I said, "Listen, uh, we have a family ministry. That's what we try to. That's the way I try to uh, work this." Uh, but when I say the word family, I mean all of it. I mean, you know, uh, crazy Uncle Bud or or whomever. We've we've got those family things taking place in our church, but we love one another. Uh, can so and so be cranky sometimes? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they can be. Uh, you know, and so we, we, we accept all the little quirks that we have uh, because that's who we are. I mean, we all have quirks. Uh, Karen tells me I have one. So, 
the, fi the final law of stewardship is the law of loving compliance. It's principle uh, incorporating genuine love and godly obedience to be lovingly compliant to do the will of God because you love him and you want to obey him. There is no coercion. It's pure obedience prompted by pure love, which produces pure stewardship. It's the very essence of Christ-likeness. Listen, one of the things I don't believe in, I, I got I to gotta teach, I got to present the word of God from the pulpit, uh, but I try not to badger people to do things in the church. Um, I want someone that when they, when they come forward to teach a class or sing a song or, or work on the facility or whatever the case may be, I want them to do it because they love the Lord and they care about uh, his ministry here and presenting the gospel uh, to the lost and encouraging the believers that attend here uh, and to do that because of their love for the Lord and they understand how important it is for them to be the conduit uh, between uh, our God and a lost world. And so that's extremely important. If it has to be coerced, there's, there's not genuine love. And if there's not genuine love, there's not genuine stewardship. Listen, one of the things that I've never felt comfortable with, uh, I do it because it's biblical. I don't like talking about money. Never have. Feel, always feel uncomfortable discussing it. I have preached it a few times uh, about, you know, tithing and what have you because it is biblical, uh, but I'm always uncomfortable with it because I don't know if people understand sometimes that God doesn't need your money. This, this pastor, this church doesn't need your money. What we need is to be obedient to God. If we will be obedient to God, and I've said to this here for many, many years, if, if you will be obedient to God, I don't have to worry about any finances in this church. Not a one. Uh, we'll be able to afford a youth pastor. We'll be able to uh, pay some of my bills. We'll be able to pay the church bills. And we'll be able to afford the things that we have to afford to do ministry. And not sweat it. Uh, do we have a million dollars in the bank? No, we don't. Uh, do we have a lot of debt? No, about 30, 32,000, 34,000 maybe. That's, there's a lot of churches out there with, that would change their financial position with us in a heartbeat, all right? Because God has been very good to us because our people have been faithful to him. And so that's, I just don't, I just don't worry about it. Um, Jesus took on the nature of a servant, literally a slave. As God, he was sovereign, deserving to be served, yet he became a slave in order to fulfill his father's uh, will. Uh, his testimony here in John 5.30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. That was his whole purpose. He didn't have to worry about all this, uh, these other things because he was here to fulfill the will of the Father. And as he uh, fulfilled his Father's will, he was able to uh, heal people, to teach people, to preach uh, the gospel. And, and so uh, Jesus could have a, a grand impact on mankind, but uh, it was going to be greater after he left. He said that when he left, he was going to send a comforter so that we could do greater things. Think about that. You know, because now, you know, Jesus was, as a man, Jesus was in one spot. But God, the Holy Spirit, he's everywhere. And the greater things that I used to scratch my head, what do you mean greater things? And the uh, way I look at it is, is that we've got millions of believers in the world that are witnessing and testifying and, and uh, sharing the word. And so, uh, so that is a great thing. So living the law of loving compliance Pursue maturity, not perfection. As we endeavor to live by this standard, the law of loving compliance, we cannot and will not achieve perfection, but we can achieve spiritual maturity, and that should be our priority. I love to quote Vince Lombardi here. Um, when he took over the Green Bay Packers in whatever it was, 63 or whatever, uh, Lombardi told his players said that we will pursue perfection knowing full well that perfection is impossible. But in the pursuit of that perfection, we can achieve excellence. 
and excellence is what I've always believed is the standard uh, for us as believers in Christ. Now, my excellence might not be as grand as somebody else's. Uh, listen, I can sing and, and honor God and worship him to the human ear. It won't be pleasing, but I believe to God's ear it is. And so we have to understand and keep that in focus of how does God look at things? In Hebrews 6, 1, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So we want to pursue perfection. I think that when God tells us, be ye holy for he is holy, I don't think that's a standard that we can't meet because he wouldn't have asked us to pursue it. Pursue maturity, not perfection. Hang on. Did I just say that? Oh, man, copied it wrong. Maturity, in this sense, refers to our being anchored in the truth of God's word. Uh, in, in Hebrews 6, 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. So our hope, what's our hope? Our hope's eternity in heaven, amen? That's where we're, that's, that's, that's what this is all about, that as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, uh, as has been the first fruits of the, from the grave, it tells me that uh, one day I'm going to die uh, if I'm not here for the rapture, and I'll be taken, uh, I'll be taken into heaven, and uh, we're going to, uh, that's the hope that I go through each day, that no matter what happens here, I've got a home in heaven waiting for me. Yield the right away. The good steward is a, is a good servant, one whose rights have been yielded fully to the Lord. Such a servant claims ownership of nothing but stewardship of all that God has given. Daily and deliberately, the trustworthy steward dedicates everything to him alone. And again, it's the, do we really believe it? We say it, but is it the way that we process things through our mind? Uh, I'm going to um, donate money to this organization. Is it, is it something that will honor God? Is it something uh, that will uh, uh, please him? Run with the finish line uh, in view. That should be line, not lies. Uh, in the race of life, don't grow weary or lose heart because it's all worth it. And again, in Hebrews 12, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. When we're talking about uh, being com compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, listen, I've heard it preached different ways. Um, I've heard people, people say that they believe that uh, there's believers that are, are, are peering over the banister of heaven and they're watching us. I, I don't necessarily go with that. All right, I've, I've heard, I've heard learned men preach that. Um, I personally would tell you that what we're talking about here is the witness of those saints that have gone before us, their faith of Abraham, uh, the faith of, of Isaac and, and Jacob and Noah and Moses, that that witness is, is uh, what encourages us and that yeah, validates, if you will, our faith that, uh, you know, these, these men and women, they were looking forward to something that most of them didn't see. They didn't see Jesus Christ, you know, walk this earth. They didn't see the arrival of the Messiah. Uh, they had hopes for one, but their faith was in something that was yet to happen. Uh, our faith is looking back at the cross, uh, able to historically, we can account for Jesus uh, we can look back and say, yeah, this took place and have that faith in him that he's going to come back again. So I would tell you that the great cloud of witnesses are the saints of the Old Testament that have given us an example of what faith was. Uh, we have a race marked out for us by God himself as a faithful steward. Uh, run strong, keep your eyes on the finish line. The one you serve is waiting there ready to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We can't afford, remember two weeks ago I stood right here and I just, I begged us, 
don't let Satan in. Don't let Satan interrupt us. Don't let Satan, you know, uh, discourage us because he's coming. And I knew he was coming. And he, matter of fact, he had already come and disrupted uh, one family. And so uh, I was so angry about that. And it just really, I need us to be aware that when Satan comes that we just get thee behind me, Satan. Just, just resist him. Tell him to, to take a hike. Leave us alone. Uh, because Jesus is there waiting for us to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And to be able to receive that, we have to be a faithful servant. We have to do what he expects of us to do, what his word commands us to do. And uh, I think part of that is, is that um, we should have great expectations of how God will bless us. Listen, I don't know about you, but as I've been going through uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, when you realize that and and this Sunday, Lord will, and we get into that ninth chapter of Nehemiah, uh, it is just so powerful um, to account for the sins of men and the repeated forgiveness of God. And that forgiveness is given so lovingly and freely to us. Um, so we want to be we want to be faithful with that. Any questions, comments about what? We're